Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for iPad Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Coming up on iPad Today, apps that we already know and love but have just gotten better. Plus, touchless gesture controlled apps for the kitchen. I like it already. And we're going to Africa-ish. All that and a stylist for everybody on iPad Today. This episode of iPad Today is brought to you by GoToMyPC. Attention iPad owners, access your applications and files on your home or office computer from your iPad with GoToMyPC by Citrix. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMyPC.com, promo code iPad today. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. For Hover's transfer concierge service, free for our audience, go to iPadToday.Hover.com, offer code iPad today. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. Woohoo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of iPad Today. This is episode 46, and usually you see Leo first. So I know what you're thinking. Something's wrong. Something terrible has happened. It's not true. Don't listen to them because I'm joined by none other than the very lovely and talented friend of mine, Veronica Belmont via Skype. Hello, Veronica. Thank you. Yay, Welcome thank to you for the having show. me. You know, it's funny. I was, um, when I, I, Leo had to take the day off today. Nothing big. He just, every once in a while, has to take a day off because he's a busy guy. And I said, would you be willing to do the show with me? And I thought, well, you're really busy too. So it was a shot in the dark, but you were able to. And then I realized, you know what? You are the very first female co-host that we've ever had. I mean, not counting me, obviously. Oh, wow. It's a chick show today. and Very cool. Uh, yeah, I never really, it's not that it's ever been an issue before, but it's kind of nice. We've been on shows together many times. That's true. Just not this one. Uh, but I know before. that you have an iPad. And I know that, I mean, obviously, you're a huge gadget person. Um, and by the way, we've worked to, with each other in the past, not just on uh, Twitch shows, but Revision 3, you co-host mm -hmm. Techzilla with Patrick Norton. You're also the host of Core on the PlayStation Network. So, I mean, this is kind of your thing. You you do this stuff for a living. You have to know about iOS and the App Store. and Yes, all the I wish I actually had on. more time to spend on apps because I've been using my iPad more and more lately. I, I recently got an iPad too. It, it took me a while to get around to updating, um, but I'm really happy that I did. So I've been trying to find some good apps to put on here. I'm sending my mom my original iPad. She's excited. That, I have to yeah. find some good mom friendly. You should do a mom friendly app show. Well, That'd be great. we try to. We did, there's definitely a lot of. I, I would say one of the things that surprised me the most once we, the show got up and going, and we started getting a lot of feedback from people and what they like and what they want to see more of. I mean, people want to see accessories, which is just really difficult because, yeah, you know how the whole accessories coming in and out. That's a whole. You know, you need a full time person to to handle all of that stuff and mm -hmm. folks who. Um, are interested in apps for kids, you know, whether it's kids. keeping, That's keeping a big your one. kids occupied or educational or look at this video of my toddler playing Angry Birds. I have the smartest toddler in the world, all of that good stuff. Um, I think so, kids really, kids really take to the iPad. I've noticed it's like they almost instantly know how to use it, which is kind of creepy. And then, um, actually one toddler that I know, he tries to use other devices as though they had touch screens because he's so accustomed to the iPad. Well, that toddler has something in common with me then because I'm constantly touching my MacBook now and trying to swipe <laughs> up. I mean, it's, it's sort of weird, but I have a feeling that Steve Jobs wants me to do that so that when Lion comes out, then the gestures are going to be more intuitive. Mm -hmm. That's just the idea. But anyway, let's get into our theme. Of course, at the top of the show, we always have a theme where we, we, we pick a few apps that are similar to each other but might stand out from each other in a variety of ways. But every once in a while, we think, you know, we cover a lot of apps. And sometimes an app six months after it's released is better or different or has pivoted or, for whatever reason, deserves a little bit more recognition. Um, so this is one of those days. So we're talking today about apps that we love, that for whatever reason we've talked about in the past, but have gotten better. 
And the first app, Veronica, I know you're a huge user of this because we're friends on this network, is Instagram. Instagram is kind of like the darling of the iOS scene as far as photo sharing goes to the point now where I visit Flickr a lot less frequently mm. and it kind of scares me because I was such a rabid Flickr user for so long. I still send Instagram photos to Flickr because that's something easily that you can do within uh, the settings when you share photos with other networks. Um, but yeah, Instagram here, I'm actually going to take my my smart you know, cover off I, because... I'm exactly the same way. I haven't been to Flickr in a really long time. And when I do, it's because someone leaves a comment on an Instagram photo that I've sent to Flickr. And it makes me feel sad too, because I was also a huge Flickr user for years and years and years. I've had a pro account for as long as I can remember. And I don't even go there to check and see my friends' photos anymore. I just assume that everyone I follow on Flickr is now on Instagram. And it's weird how that shift has happened. I know that's happened to a lot of people. Yeah, and I... I, I... It, I think Instagram's beauty, and a lot of folks in the chat room are like, ugh, more Instagram, we're Android users, we don't have it yet. Believe me, um, I would gripe on this show that they don't have an iPad-friendly app yet because this is just the iPhone app. As you mm -hmm. can see, it does not rotate into uh, landscape mode, which drives me nuts because I'm actually a landscape mode preferred user whenever possible. I just like it better than portrait mode. But I'm not going to complain about it because I know that the Instagram folks are working on an Android app. Believe me, they want millions of new users. <laughs> there's, no, there's no reason for them to to want to leave you guys out. I know that they're working on it. Um, but for the folks that still for that do use Instagram, there's a few reasons it's cool on the iPad. Namely, because with the iPad 2, we actually have cameras now. It's not a great camera. It's not an iPhone 4 camera. And in fact, I don't very often use my iPad 2 camera to upload a picture to Instagram, although I do if it's the only one I have handy. Mm -hmm. But um, in the profile section, you've got some more options that actually make the sharing aspect of Instagram kind of more cool and social. If I go into my profile and I go into the edit profile feature, um, something that Instagram never had before was a place to put in a bio. And the thing that always bothered me about that is, I mean, that's how I, I learn who people are on Twitter half the time. It's like, you know, this person looks familiar or maybe a lot of, of my friends are at replying this person. I quickly look at their bio and see if I know them. But Instagram never had a way to do that before. With the most recent update, now they do. I decided to call myself that lady on Twit. That's my new Instagram <laughs> bio. I've never really called myself that before, but... You know, I've been wondering why they haven't put out an iPad version. Um, I don't know what's what's taking so long. You know, both Android and iPad, I feel like their team should be growing. I mean, they have a lot of funding at this point. So it's surprising to me that they haven't put out an iPad version earlier. There is a website, though, that I think works on the iPad, which does a really nice job of representing all your Instagram photos, and it's called Extragram. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've, if you've used it before, but it allows you to view all of your photos, allows you to comment on them, like them, view your friends' photos. And I think the search features on Instagram are actually a lot more evolved than the ones in the actual Instagram app. Yeah. So it's a nice kind of external way. It uses the, um, the Instagram API and their authorization. So um, hopefully, they don't, I don't think they have your password. I think it's just using the API, so it should be okay. Um, but I've used it a lot on the website because it's like having Instagram on your, on your computer as well. Right, and it's, it's funny, they, they actually now, there's an iOS app, gosh, what's it called? Carousel. Um, it's, a, it's a Mac app that uh, works really nicely, but it, that's true. It's like, until recently, until people sort of got wise and said, well, people don't necessarily want to just view Instagram on their phone or their iPad. I mean, even when I view it on my iPad, I'm still blowing up the photos and they get a little grainy. A little fuzzy. Um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of options when using Instagram. It's a lot of fun. One other thing really quick uh, that they did also update that I really appreciate because I had turned off push notifications because I'm lucky enough to have a lot of followers on Instagram, which I love, but it's just once you get to a certain point, you can't have a push notification anytime anyone comments or, or likes a photo. I certainly don't think that anyone would want a push notification every time I like photos because I like photos all over the place, but mm -hmm. their push notifications have gotten better um, this is also in the profile settings. I can just uh, turn on like notifications just from people I follow. You know, so that's more like 100 people rather than, you know, thousands of people. Comment notifications, same thing from people I follow. Because those are actually, you know, I'm more inclined to maybe keep the conversation going. Now we've mm -hmm. threaded replies mm -hmm. within Instagram. That's pretty helpful. So, that, that, you know, those are, the, those are two. Um, uh, and it, especially with Instagram as well. I mean, those are a variety of ways that Instagram, even for your Android folks or your iP or you iPad folks who think, oh, it's iPhone only, I'm just not interested yet. You can still be a member 
and mm-hmm. and look at people's photos and make fun of our uh, our our filter choices. Um, I don't know about <laughs> you, I don't know about you, but I have found that Camera Plus, which is also an iPhone app, mm-hmm. um, not sure if they have an Android app or not. Um, Camera Plus combined with Instagram, while cumbersome, is the best. You get the best um, final uh, picture because they do HDR so well on Camera Plus. I don't know if you've ever put the two yeah. together. I haven't actually put those two together. I've used a few different camera apps in the past. Um, I like, uh, have you tried Noir? No. From Yeah, Noir from Red Giant is really nice. And, and Plastic Bullet, I, I'm not sure if that one's out yet, actually. Um, but Camera Plus is good. I haven't used it in a while. I should double check and see what changes they've made recently. Remember when Hipstamatic was the only one anyone used? Yes, yes. And in fact, I remember when Instagram first came out, they were previously the bourbon folks. I don't know if you ever used bourbon. No. But I kept trying to get them. Yeah, they were... They had to talk about pivot. Those the Instagram guys had a whole different. Uh, they were working on other things. Let's just say beforehand. And when Instagram came out, I was like, uh, they just did another hipstamatic, but not so. They made a hipstamatic social network that's that's been extremely successful. I hope they get on the Android thing soon. I think that's really important. I think a lot of people are looking forward to that and waiting for that in a big way. Yeah, and in fact, I think it's it's uh, when Instagram. I I know because I've 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 talked to Kevin and Mikey that. They didn't realize that they were going to grow as fast as they did, and obviously they've been they've done really well with the scaling, considering that they have so many users and they grew so fast. Um, but it does tend to upset folks who feel like they've been left out in the cold because this was, I mean, it wasn't that they never wanted to make an Android app. It just became very clear that oh my gosh, this app is a hit. All the iOS people are talking about it, and then people who are on. Um, who are on other smartphone OSs just end up getting sort of more annoyed. It's like, oh gosh, you know, it's this little club, very clicky yeah. kind of thing. Another app that we talked about, in fact, Leo and I talked about it last week. It was ridiculous. I talked about Downcast um, as one of our podcasting. If you want to circumvent iTunes and you just want to uh, subscribe to a variety of podcasts, like anything on Twit or, or anything on Revision 3, um, that uh, Downcast was one of the good options, even though it wasn't iPad enabled. Well, it was enabled, but it wasn't enhanced for iPad. I mm-hmm. still found it to be the best of the bunch, but I got a bunch of emails from people. I swear it probably got an update last Thursday, and by the time we went to record the show, I didn't know about it. Um, Downcast is now iPad enabled, and it looks really beautiful. In fact, I'm looking at... Uh, Buzz Out Loud, which I just subscribed to because I'm going to start um, listening to it on my way up because I get stuck in the car commuting and I figure, well, they, sh- they shoot their show earlier than me. So it's a good way to like get their take on the today's news before we do TNT. That's smart. Ah, I see what you did there. Yeah. yeah well, you know, you got to You got to know what the other smart people are saying. Right. So mm-hmm. Downcast is it's uh, I won't go into too much of the details because uh, Leo and I talked about it at length last week. And by the way, thanks to everybody who wrote in with other uh, podcast program suggestions and this and that. But it's, you know, it's really just, it's it's a better enhanced experience. So instead of blowing it up, um, it just looks better, you know, especially with the graphics. You know, if you're looking at um, show graphics and, and you're navigating, it does better with screen real estate. Um, there is a little bit of layout changes um, where the sleep timer, you had to kind of go into settings. You have just this nice little icon that, that hangs out at the top all the time. My little... 2x, which is one of the features that we were talking about last week. If you want to listen to a podcast twice as fast because you have limited time, but you don't want to miss anything, that's all there. Um, I've never tried that. Does that actually work? Have you have you done that in practice? Well, no, but uh, we've had people write in and say this is a feature that I really like with these podcasting apps because we don't want you to sound like chipmunks, but we don't have an hour either. So if you could just sort of take out all that dead space in between words, people actually do that. That's pretty fascinating. I know. Actually, you know, I'm going to check this out because I've pretty much stopped using iTunes and my iPhone for everything. Well, I use my iPhone, but I've stopped using iTunes. I listen to all my audiobooks on on the Audible app, and I listen to most of my music on the Audio app at mm-hmm. this point. So the only thing I was still syncing with my iPhone were podcasts, but now maybe I don't have to do that anymore. I don't yeah. know why I'm doing that now. It just kind of has happened that way. It's weird because, yeah, so last week... We kept, uh, again, in the chat room, people were saying, you know, you can just do all this through iTunes. You don't need to buy an app for $1.99, which is how much Downcast costs. 
in order to subscribe to a podcast. And we were saying, no, you don't, but it's just an option, especially sometimes people don't want to have to sync with iTunes and do everything on, on their laptop and then sync with their iPad. And you hear about issues that people have all the time with, oh, it didn't sync properly or this or that. You can just go straight through something like Downcast. It's just another option. And it depends on, on how your workflow is. So, mm -hmm. Veronica, I know that uh, you are um, new to the show, so you're new to our theme. And the app that you wanted to talk about, I don't know if it's new to you or better to you or anything in between, but I want to know more. All right. Well, it's not. It's I don't think they've had a major update recently, but it is relatively new. It's the uh, This American Life iPad app. Nice. And I'm absolutely loving it. You can listen to recently aired episodes. You can go way back into their archives. And then there's special stuff like really old school Ira Glass um, radio sh posts and things he's done in the past. And there's extras and things from their live show. And I just think it's a really fun way to kind of experience this American Life community. And mm -hmm. it looks great on the iPad. And you can listen to it right from here as well. You don't have to open it in iTunes or anything like that. Do you feel like um, if you, let's say you had the NPR app already downloaded, do you, do you feel like uh, This American Life itself as its own iPad app is somehow better? Or do they have more kind of behind the scenes extras that you wouldn't get with NPR's app overall? I think so. They have a big contributor section where you can read about all the contributors that have been on the show. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and then there's all the shows, and you can see clips from the TV episodes as well. So I think it puts a lot of focus on this show in particular. Um, it, it, so NPR, it, This American Life is PRI, right? It's the other public radio thing, or are they different? Yeah, I get so very it's confused something that sometimes. NPR uh, buys, I guess. Okay, yeah. But I think, I think it's a great app. I think it looks really good. They had an iPhone version that also worked okay on, on the iPad as well, but this one is definitely optimized for iPad. And it's $4.99. It's a little bit on the expensive side. Mm -hmm. But if you're really into the show, I think it's worth it. Do you listen to the show every week? Are you a, I, are you a diehard This American Life listener? I was up until recently, and then I started doing audiobooks almost full time because of Sword and Laser, the show mm -hmm. that I do with Tom. Um, we, we have so much reading to get through that I've been trying to fill every waking moment that isn't spent at the computer or doing something else, listening to books if I'm not actually reading them. Yeah. So it's, it's the audiobook thing has taken up a lot of my podcast listening time in the past few months. Well, This American Life is a great show. I, I admit, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm, that I'm, listening to it every week, but I do every once in a while, especially if I know I'm going to be flying or something and I can bank a bunch of shows and then just kind of put my head back and listen for a while. It's mm -hmm. a really, it's a really good show. If anybody out there isn't familiar with it, I know we've, we've talked about it here and there on the show in the past, but it is just, it's one of those shows that, you know, an audio show as well. Um, although they did do TV, they did a TV experiment. Um, it didn't last very long, but it was also really good. It was good. It was good. Yeah, yeah I, I liked was, it I was kind of bummed when that got yanked because I found it by accident, I think in sort of my, I don't know, Netflix settings or something. Well, it wasn't Netflix, but anyway, uh, This American Life, it's a great show. Like Veronica said, it's five bucks for the app. So maybe check it out on iTunes, see what the features are, get a sense of whether you just want to listen to the show. Maybe the NPR app is all you really need. And if mm -hmm. you want to know more about each episode and the stories behind it and the people who contributed, then this would be a good app as well. Um, just want to mention that all the apps that we talk about, all the links, all the prices, you don't have to write it down while we're going on the show because we put all of that stuff up on our website. Our URL is twit.tv slash IPT. That's also where you can see all of our show archives. If, um, if you're watching this live, you already know that we recorded the show live at 1.30 uh, p.m. Pacific on Thursdays. But if for any reason you're watching us later and you want to watch us live, that's when to do it. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's sort of the, it's the, it's the rough version of the show without, uh, without lower thirds. So there's kind of two versions of the show. There's the live show that we're doing right now. And then there's the package show that we release later um, that has a little bit more bells and whistles and sound effects and things like that. So you can watch both if, you, if, you're, if you're a diehard fan or, uh, or choose one. We don't care. And subscribe to the show if, for whatever reason, you can't remember Thursdays or you just you don't want to think about when a new show is coming out. You can just get those delivered straight to your um, iTunes or your Downcast, Downcast. or anything in between. Um, those certainly aren't your only options, but they're two good ones. All right, so we're going to get into a few news stories, but before we do, want to thank Go to My PC for being a sponsor of today's episode. Go to My PC is actually new for iPad users. There's a Go to My PC for iPad app that's awesome because 
One of the complaints that people always have about iPads is, well, iPads are great and everything, but it's not like they're a substitute for my computer. There are things that I have on my computer, whether it's whether it's uh, certain files or, um, you know, just with layouts. I, I'm trying to look for my go to PC uh, app because I already downloaded it. I don't know where it is right now because I haven't I haven't my folders are all messy right now, but. The whole idea is that that's that's kind of why people go, can I really use my iPad every day all the time? Because I just, I've got stuff on my computer that I need and my app is, is for other stuff. Well, that's not true. You can actually access all of your files, all of your documents, videos. I mean, anything that you have on your PC or Mac, you can access on your iPad. You can also access on another computer. Believe me, this is not iPad only. This is just go to my PC's newest edition is the ability to access your PC or your Mac on your iPad, it's very easy to set up. You go to go to mypc.com, you set up an account, and by the way, you can try it for free. Um, if you wanna download the free Go To My PC app in the App Store, you can visit go to mypc.com, click the try it free button. Uh, they want to know, you know your name, and, and when uh, they ask you if you have an offer code, you say, well, yes, yes I do, and that offer code is iPad today. That's all one word, iPad today. So. Try it out for free if you want to access your files remotely. And who doesn't every once in a while? This stuff comes up, comes up all the time. Go to my PC is a great solution. And again, our special offer code to get to try it out for free is go to me, mypc.com. Offer code iPad today. All right, moving on to the news now. Veronica, I, I know you well enough to know that you are a Guilt Group fan, as am I. Just a little bit. Yeah. So how much? Just do you, an expensive little bit. How much do you think? I, I don't want to ask you how much you think you've spent at Guild Group, <laughs> but how? I mean, how often have you made a transaction? Do you think since they <sighs> launched? Oh, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. Jeez. Um, well, if you're counting all of those sites, I mean, Guilt is probably my top one that I use to buy clothes on. Uh -huh. I think I probably now buy more clothes on Guilt than I do like at the store. Right. So I would say I probably buy something from there maybe once a month, maybe twice a month, probably more like once a month. I'm not going overboard at this point. I did get a weird tax letter about that, um, but that's for another time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. You really are good. Something about I buy too much stuff that so I thought I was like wholesaling things. Oh my goodness Like I was gracious. a wholesaler. Um, yeah. You're the I, definition I of a loyal customer then. Wow. I'd I am. Love to and I... I use Jet Setter religiously as well. I'm a big Jet Setter fan, which is also a Guilt Group property. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of the Guilt Group. So we're looking at Guilt right now. This is the iPad app. Uh, started as a, as a website, so it's not just an app, although their app is great. Um, and we've talked about it in the past before. And it kind of, it, you know, Guilt has gone through a, um, a, a, a real growth spurt because it started as a way for women to shop online. Um, and the way that they hook you is, is that they, they have these incredible deals um, for stuff that's only available for a limited time. So you kind of have that like, ah, I better get on this dress because once it sells out, it's sold out. Like for example, mm -hmm. all they have is size six and up. So it's like, well, I'm too small. I can't wear this dress anymore because I, I missed all the lower sizes type but of thing. But you can put it on your wait list. Exactly. Yeah. So if get, you like it, something, add it to your wait list. And then if it comes back, they email you automatically. And then you can do that, that instant like, boing, got it. So true. Yeah. So Guild, ha Guild is, uh, believe me, if you have a shopping addiction, stay, stay far, far away. Otherwise, um, it's a really great way to get good deals on you know, very nice stuff. I mean, it's name brand stuff. Um, it's good quality. I've shopped from them before as well. Jet Setter, as Veronica mentioned, is kind of the guilt for travel. So you can, um, and, and I talked about Jet Setter on a recent episode where you can sometimes look at 360 views of a hotel that you're thinking about to really get a sense of what your view would be when you're sitting at the pool, for example, because sometimes uh, hotels want you to think it looks a certain way, but does it really mm -hmm. look that way? Now, the most recent entry into the Guilt family is something called Guilt Taste. Guilt Taste is right now um, just a website, and they got um, some press yesterday um, there was, it was weird. You, they, can, you can buy stuff now, can't you? Is it not, can you not buy stuff yet? No, no, no. Yeah, you can. It's just, okay. it's just a, it's the web version. Oh, it's not an app. I yeah, gotcha. it's not an app yet. And in fact, when you go to Guilt Taste, it's cool because they've got, um, not only do they have buying of, of certain kinds of food, obviously food is a little bit tricky because things spoil and, you know, you have to be careful if you're buying produce over the internet, but they have very, you know, kind of, um, you know, specialty meats or a certain kind of uh, uh, 
food package maybe that would be a good gift for somebody. So it's interesting. They, they, they have a way of, of putting stuff together where you go, ooh, this would be a fun every once in a while type of a purchase. Um, yeah, it reminds me of like Omaha Steaks. Exactly. Like stuff you can buy online. Um, I don't know how good it is for us here, though, because we, you know, we're kind of spoiled. We live in the Bay Area. We have access to a lot of really high-end meats and stuff that we can get at the farmer's market. But um, it seems really cool, especially like the sweets and the equipment. And, you know, if you want a really fancy cheese that you can't get in your neighborhood, I think it's a neat way to find presents and just stuff for special occasions, especially. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've got Flannery beef for sale right now, which is like $128. Um, expensive yeah. yeah and but it's it, again it's kind of like that high-end special occasion or maybe a gift or or if you're just a foodie and this is, this is sort of up your alley what's nice about guilt taste and this is something that i i assume that they'll, they'll try to roll out through all of their properties but they're definitely doing on on guilt taste is they're not just selling food they also have articles about uh recipes you know this is the most awesome new way to um cook broccoli, for example, or <laughs> here's a Q&A with this really amazing chef that you may or may not have heard of before, experts, because of course, when you get into food, there's a lot that we all have to learn about it. It's not just like, I like that dress. There's there's so much more to the backstory. But there was an interesting story on TechCrunch yesterday. There are actually two articles on TechCrunch about Guilt Taste yesterday. The first one was Guilt Taste launches online. Here it is. It's very cool. And the second article actually was... Um, struck me as interesting because apparently the guilt taste folks are working on an app. It's not live yet, but they're working on an app that will allow visual gesturing, let's say when you're cooking, to go through a recipe uh, when, you, you know, you're, if, when you're in the middle of cooking. And this happens to me all the time. Veronica, I don't know if you, if you cook off a lot of recipes very often. I do. I, I do. Yeah, so you pull up a something on your on your iPad and you try to put it out of the way so when you know if spaghetti sauce splatters or something it won't get on the iPad but then you know it'll go into sleep mode or you need to scroll up or you need to look at something again and it's like my hands are dirty. So I love the idea of watching maybe an instructional video or just looking at um, an ingredient list and being able to swipe with my hand or zoom in or something based on my little iPad 2 camera. I don't know how they're going to do it, but that would be awesome. That would be handy. Or voice commands. Or if they could have voice commands, that would be great. You could just be like, next, next step. And then it would go to the next thing. I use the All Recipes iPad app, actually. Oh, you do? For, um, a lot of cooking stuff, and it's worked really well. I mostly use Epicurious, but I've gotten a little frustrated with it lately. Not because it's not a good app, but sometimes I just... It, Epicurious wants to... Um, they. They want to know you really well, like, okay, what's your main ingredient? So I'll say, okay, broccoli, but maybe it's broccoli and tofu and mushrooms. And I just like, I just want to figure out what to do with those three ingredients. I don't necessarily want to pick what my standout um, ingredient is. Oh, but yeah. I think All Recipes has something like that, actually. Uh, they have a, like a dinner spinner. Mm. I'm not sure if that's for, for iPhone or if that's actually part of the iPad app as well. I think it's part of the iPad app where you can put in some of your ingredients and then it'll mix them together and make some kind of, some kind of recipe out of it that it pulls up from its database. Um, I know they've got the Inspire Me section where you can just find, it has like cool pictures of all yummy looking food stuff nice. that you might want to make. That looks way too difficult for me. Yeah, I am not a good, not a good cook. I'm not a good cook either, but I can not follow a recipe. It's like if I, if all the ingredients are there, I can follow the recipe, and I assume it tastes as good as it would if an expert did the same thing. But oh no, no, that's the thing. I do that same thing, but then I don't taste it the entire way through until the very end, and it's all wrong. Really? Yeah, I, I follow things because you know because we're we're geeks. We know how to follow like directions, directions yeah. really well, and we're smart about two you thirds know, of a cup measurements I will do that. and stuff like that. But then that was kind of a over like a far reaching generalization. But anyway, um, I I do that myself, and then I get to the end, and I just you have to use some amount of intuition. Really, there's intuition there that I have not yet learned, and I have to kind of keep doing that over time. I'm just happy I can make a poached egg. I learned that recently. I saw your go. Instagram photo, by the way, <laughs> and I thought to myself, how did she do that? I'm sure it's not hard, but I've never done it before. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> we see we brought it full circle. There we go. There you go. From food right. back to Instagram. All right, moving on. I, we, we've never had a, a section of the show before called New York New York App Explosion, but I decided to make one today just because there happened to be two 
focused on New York apps that came across our radar that were really cool. And so I was like, okay, they're having a New York app explosion, I guess. The first one uh, you may have seen, Laughing Squid covered it, um, as did a lot of other folks called the New York Public Library Biblion for iPad. So the idea here is that the New York Public Library obviously is a very big library with many branches. Um, if you haven't visited their their sort of main library, beautiful uh, main reading room, it's gorge. I mean, go there if you're ever in New York in real life and you haven't been there before. But if you if you can't make it to the New York Public Library, that's fine because what they're trying to do is package a lot of interesting information and get it out to you um, online and now via apps. For example. This newest app experience, I mean, obviously you couldn't put any everything in the public library into an app because it would never stop downloading. But what they're trying to do is package certain um, uh, events and categories so that you, you, would, you, would, you would purchase one. Um, oh, actually, you don't even have to purchase it because it's free, but you would download one and, and absorb it. And then you know, if you like what you see, then, then you would download their next iteration. But the first iteration is all about the World's Fair that happened in New York um, in 1939 and 1940. And oh, this, cool. Yeah, it's I mean, it's really, whoa. Um, it's, I'm still trying to get down the, the, <laughs> the navigation of this. But I it's, love um, the navigation, though. It looks really great. It's real. yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of as far away from a library, uh, if we all remember, you know, the Dewey Decimal System and all that library stuff that we all had to remember. And some of you watching probably are like, no, I don't know what you mean because... Why would I go to a library kind of thing? Well, going to libraries was something that I had to do all the time, um, whether I wanted to or not, you know, in school and, and just to get free books and things like that. And this is um, an app just crashed, so that's worth mentioning that uh, it's not perfect yet. But this is all about um, pretty much all of their, not only newspaper clippings, but artwork from the time of this World's Fair um, that is available now. And here's what's kind of interesting about it is, is that, and this... I don't know if I like this or I don't like this because um, many magazines, if they're done well for iPad, will let you rotate portrait or landscape. Veronica, I know that you're a portrait fan, but I'm a landscape fan. So I always like it when I have the option to do either one, you know, depending on how mm -hmm. I'm sitting, you know, one might be more comfortable than the other. Well, this has both portrait and landscape mode, but they're very different experiences. So I'm in uh, landscape now, but if I go to portrait, now I get more of like a traditional book view. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, so so it's just it's just different, you know. I mean, it's it's uh, it takes a little getting used to. And if you look at you know again multimedia, so you've got YouTube videos that go ahead and play in line. It's really neat. Um, depending on who you talk to, when you look at some of the um, reviews for this app, people go, "Oh my gosh, this is not intuitive. I don't even know what's going on here." And you run into problems like that when you get creative with apps. I mean, I think we all realize that it's like either people will appreciate it. Um, that there's a lot going on. You can kind of click around and get a little bit lost. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I feel like what the New York Public Library folks or whoever put this together, they're obviously very talented. And I think they almost wanted to make it kind of a library experience where there's just there's just stuff everywhere, and you could spend all day hanging out in here and learning stuff, and have to find the exit when you're done. <laughs> um, but not everybody <laughs> likes that because some folks are just really into an app that's that's. Uh, that's interface is laid out uh, very clear. And you don't get lost. Veronica, I don't know. What, where do you stand on, on the way that apps are laid out? Do you like to be surprised or not? I don't really like to be surprised. Um, I really like the app uh, Show You, for example, and I use it pretty frequently. But mm -hmm. when I first got it, I could not figure out the navigation at all. And uh, it took me a while to get used to it. But now, once I got the swing of it, I'm, I'm happier with it. Um, but I kind of like to know like a certain set of, of rules and standards that I like to apply across multiple apps. Yeah. Um, just because I think it's important for people to feel comfortable using the software right off the bat. So they don't have that initial, I'm lost feeling that can kind of turn people off an app. I mean, look at color, for example. People didn't know what the heck was going on. And a lot of people dropped it immediately, I being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, it's cool that when you're digging into this app in particular, you really find like these special treasures. And so that kind of encourages you to experiment a little bit more and kind of dig into the app. I wonder if that's something that Apple is really going to have to address. Well, I don't know how they're going to be able to do it the way that the app system works now because people can just make the app that they want as long as they fall within Apple's guidelines. But 
I mean, Steve Jobs and team are all about making things intuitive. So what you were describing where people get turned off by their confusion and then they just don't want to revisit something. I mean, Apple is all about that not happening for people, you know, making it as easy as possible um, so that anybody can sit down in front of a computer and say, this is working the way that I would think it's working. Obviously, there's some bit of a learning curve, but mm -hmm. fewer questions, the better. But with apps, I mean, it just all depends on the app itself, even though it's within the Apple ecosystem, I guess. Apple really has, doesn't have much of a say in what goes into the, the UI. Well, but they can stop from publishing the app if they really don't like how you put things together. Yeah, but they, I mean... They really feel like you're, if you're not using it to the best of... I don't know, have they done that? I wonder, actually. I, I can't say that from, from experience or from first-hand knowledge if they've ever shut down an app or, or not approved an app because it went so out of bounds of what they, they consider good navigation design, I guess, UI well, design. I could see um, I could see them really getting a lot of flack for that. I, you know, if something was crashing every five seconds and just clearly didn't work on any mm -hmm. iPad ever or iPhone or, or anything in between, there actually isn't anything in between, but you know what I mean? Um, I could see them being like, we just can't in good faith have this app available, especially if you have to pay for it. But can you imagine if Steve Jobs is like, sorry, I don't this, like is, it. this is just too <laughs> ugly. I don't like it. And Not in my, in my store. No, sir. Yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah. Uh, the next New York themed app, which is, um, I should say right off the bat, this is iPhone. This is for iPhones, um, not only because it's just, it's not, um, it, it hasn't been optimized for an iPad, but it also really takes advantage of the, the folks who made this, um, who are actually the tree hugger folks, which is owned by Discovery, even though uh, this app is called Leaf Snap. And Amber MacArthur actually turned me onto this. I don't know where she found it because I hadn't heard of it. Um, is an app designed to take pictures of leaves. I know this sounds crazy, but stay with me. Take pictures of leaves when you're out and about on a walk in Central Park, for example, and then Leaf Snap will say, oh, based on this photo that you took of this leaf, I can determine what kind of tree it is, which is awesome. I mean- That is pretty cool. I know, it's like facial recognition, but for leaves. So um, I, just because I think this is so cool and obviously the implications are great. I mean, eventually the iPad 2 will have a better camera and uh, Leaf Snap will be something that works better, you know, be on the iPhone. Um, so I thought that it was just worth mentioning because there's a lot of potential here, but it does actually work. I mean, if, if I wanted to browse, for example, it, and I'm not a tree fanatic, nor am I a tree expert. In fact, I don't really know much about trees at all. I mean, I can show you a pine tree outside, but that's about it. Um, you can learn a lot about just different kinds of trees. And if you saw, you know, an interesting leaf, like what kind of, oh, it's American sycamore, blah, blah, blah. And you, you know, you get a variety of pictures. I, I know it's like, and you think, well, I'm just not a tree person. What I really, you know, it's almost like bird watching. It's like, you're either into it or you're not. Um, but they also have, um, interesting, oh, oh, the collection areas. If I were actually, um, creating collections of stuff that I had seen out and about, but if I wanted to snap it, and again, I'm just going to have to fake this because I'm not in Central Park. By the way, this is in Washington, D.C. as well. It's not just New York, um, but it um, it's kind of designed to be used in New York, and I think they just kind of opened it up to some of the... To, so does it have like Northeast. a database of, of local flora? It kind does, of stuff? yeah. Okay. Every, all of, in fact, all of the leaves that you have to choose from when you're just like, if you wanted to just go through their little database of leaves, uh, many of them we wouldn't see here in California. Um, right. They just don't exist out here. Or they don't grow well or whatever. So if I wanted to take a picture of a leaf, and I'll, again, I'll just, I'll just fake this. I'll actually take a picture of myself taking a picture, which is really weird. But I go ahead it's and snap just explode. it. I know, so weird. I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, does it only Meltdown. use Wi-Fi? Um, does, it, does it work over 3G? Uh, yeah, yeah, 3G or oh, Wi-Fi. Oh, it does? Okay, good. Yeah. So um, if I- I was about to say, if it doesn't work over, over 3G, that would be pretty inconvenient walking around Central Park. Exactly. Unless Central Park has Wi-Fi, which I would not be surprised if it did. Um, although, did you hear about the whole Mayor Bloomberg initiative? He wants all public parks to be equipped with Wi-Fi in New York. He wants, I mean, Twitter accounts that are updated regularly with, with city updates and government, uh, I don't know, this or that. I mean, he's yeah. he's got this whole push to make New York the most digital city in the U.S., which is like every city wants to be that. But, I mean, if New York can pull it off uh, well, totally. then, I mean, that's pretty amazing, which is cool about LeafSnap is that it's like uh, your image is not a leaf. 
So <laughs> why don't you try to play nicely and not insult us is pretty much what they just said to me because I took a picture of the studio and that's not a leaf. So it's smart enough to know, well, you know what? You're not even, this isn't a leaf. Come back to us when, when, uh, when you want to play the game, right? Speaking of games, um, really quickly, they do have some like interesting games. And I know that some of this seems really silly, but again, imagine if you had a kid and, and you wanted you know them to learn a little bit about botany. You know, what's a sassafras leaf? I mean, oh, I guess right. Cool. So I get um, sucked into this stuff really easily. That's not a magnolia. And so on and so forth. So leaf snap, again, it's iPhone, um, ca- uh, it's iPad capable. It's really designed for an iPhone because, again, you want to be taking, like, high-quality pictures of your leaves. And, again, this is New York-based. Washington, D.C. as well. I assume they probably share a lot of the same kinds of trees. Veronica, you are from the East Coast, so you probably know a lot more about that than I do. Would not call myself a botanist. As well. Nope. Don't know anything about leaves. No, but you do know, I mean, maybe if you took a walk near your childhood home in your home state and took a picture with leaf snap, it would come up. I know there was a leaf that had kind of a scratchy outside, and I used to rub it on my face because it felt really nice, and then I would get like welts. So, was it? That's that's about my leaf (laughs) knowledge. Don't use that leaf for anything. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome! All right, so that 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 was our very first New York New York app explosion, which for whatever reason is a tongue twister, and I can hardly say it. So I'm never going to do this again. But thanks for playing along, Veronica. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Before we get into some of your viewer feedback, and your viewer feedback, by the way, has been so amazing to the point where I'm drowning in it now. So please, I'm so sorry if I don't get back to everybody. It's just, I I am reading everything. Um, I would say that Leo is reading those uh, emails as well, but he only does if I hold a gun to his head, which does (laughs) happen, just not every week. Um, But before we do that, I just want to quickly thank Hover for being our second sponsor of this episode of iPad Today. We love Hover. Hover is great. Um, By the way, Hover is offering Twit audience members free domain transfers. So listen up. This is this is just for you guys. No matter how many domain names you have, it's a twenty-five dollar service on the site. So it's still, I mean, it's reasonable. But just for Twit folks, if you call Hover, you give them your username and your password, they'll take it from there. The transfer itself is $10 per domain name if you want to uh, do uh, domain transfers. And this extends the domain one year beyond its current registration date. For the Twit audience, Hover will handle the whole hassle of transfer for you. No cost. iPadToday.hover.com is the URL. So that's pretty easy to remember. They will ask you an offer code, and when they do, the offer code is iPad today. So the whole idea is, you know, domain names, it's just a hassle. It's like, you want to buy a domain name? Fine. There are so many different places that you can do that. Um, Hover is, is, is by far the simplest. You know, it's, it's, they don't, it's not a lot of bells and whistles. And some domain name registrars like to tout themselves as kind of the one-stop shop for all domain needs. Um, anybody who's done any work with DNS knows that it can be just a huge hassle and you want it to be as, as hassle-free and as easy as possible because usually you're either buying something or you're transferring a domain. You know, maybe you have been using one of many other domain name services and you've just kind of had it with them. You know, there's hidden fees um, or you just don't like the layout of the site or they have bad customer service. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons that this can just be kind of a nightmare. Hover.com is, in my opinion, the most... The, the least amount of nightmare possible because domain names are just a part of life, right? I mean, I, I own a few, Veronica, I know you do too. And mm-hmm. it's important to make sure that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that you're not uh, putting yourself under undue stress. So again, special offer for Twit audience members and of course uh, viewers of iPad today, uh, free domain name transfer, no matter how many domain names you have, free. Again, the uh, URL is iPad today at hover.com. And the offer code is iPad today. All right, moving on uh, to our duh tip of the week. And this was actually, um, it started out as an email from Ken Iwatate. I hope I'm saying your name right. Maybe it's Awatate. Anyway, he lives in Richland, uh, Washington, who said, and Veronica, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I'm always fascinated by how people put together apps and how they organize apps on their iPads because no two people are alike. But Ken said, hey, I noticed, you know, everybody uses folders on the iPad, but you know what you can do is you can put a folder onto the dock if you have room. We've talked about how to do that in the past, 
but but it's really nice instead of having to flip from page to page to find the apps that you use most or having to reorganize them so that all of your favorite apps are always on the first page, especially if you have six pages of apps, you got to flip all the way back to the beginning every time you want to get to Foursquare or something that you're using very regularly. Why don't you put your favorites apps folder in the dock? And that way your favorite apps are always available no matter what page you're on. And I have to say that even though I, I guess in concept I knew that I could do this, I never had until Ken had written in. So I put together my little favorite apps um, folder in the doc. I called it faves because I'm not feeling very original. These are all the apps that it's like, no matter what I'm doing or where I am, I want them to be um, as, as easy to find as possible. I want them at my disposal because I'm constantly launching them. And, you know, Ken makes a really good point. So I'm at the last page on all of my apps, right? And I've got dead space, depending on what page I'm on, because I, I download so many apps for the show and I do so much research that it, I'm just all over the place. And it's like, oh, you have a lot of apps. I know I have a lot of apps. So it's like I can easily go back to the beginning. Right. And find my favorite apps. Um, and of course, you can search. But let's say you're on page four. You still have to do this to get back to the search area. But more likely, more often than not, I'm just trying to find one of my favorites that's in my favorites folder. And that folder never goes away no matter what I'm on. So that's I really like that. I mean, that's, it, that's such a duh, like. Duh. I know a lot of you were like, really, Sarah, you didn't had never done that before. It's not rocket science. So true. But I, I assume that if I had never done that, it's such an easy shortcut that maybe some folks um, can also benefit from. Veronica, do you do this? I haven't, but I think I might start, actually. I don't have as many apps as you do, but I do um, categorize by photo and video, travel apps, shopping, games, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I never thought to do a favorites folder. That's a really good idea, actually. Yeah, and, and it's nice because my favorite is obvious. <laughs> it's so... <laughs> it it's, is totally obvious, it's but so neither of us did it, so... Yeah, and it's, it's cool because... Not that because, that's saying much. Because, yeah, well... <laughs> yeah. Again, it's like, I kind of feel like... With iOS, we all get a little bit of a, a pass because it's just new. I mean, especially when you're talking about iPad stuff because the iPad is just over a year old, really. I mean, we're, we're still trying to figure it all out. And, you know, in five years, we'll all laugh about how people just used to dump apps onto pages without any folders and, and how did they live. But for now, it's like any organizational help I appreciate. And my faves... Really, you know, some people may just want to play games all the time on their iPad. So maybe faves would just be their game folder. But for or maybe me, just replace everything in the dock with all the different category folders. Or that. Yeah. I mean, if you do that more shop. than you need to access your mail app, for example, then, you know, you just know that your mail's on the first page and make it easier on yourself. I really like that. So thanks, Ken. That was a great duh tip. Even if you didn't want it to be, it's what I decided to call it. Um, now, on to a voicemail from Anonymous. This is in response to last week we got a very sad voicemail from a nice woman who did not want to be named, who had, who had dropped her iPad 2 and shattered it and said, gosh, why won't Apple Care cover this? I mean, I would pay for it, but they won't. And Leo kind of said, that's just the way it goes. It sucks, but that's the reality of it. So Anonymous decided to uh, call in and give us a different take. Hey, Sarah and Leo, I just wanted to let you know that, like the caller last week, I also dropped my iPod, my iPad, too, and had the screen shutter, and I went to the Apple Store and threw myself in the mercy of the genius, and they were very nice to me. They saw that I had bought a lot of Apple stuff in the past and that I was a good customer, and they swapped out my iPad for a new one. No fuss, no muss. Apple has great customer service. Mm, selective customer service. So have like. you ever had the experience where, because what I will say for Apple employees um, is that, and I know that everybody has bad days. I have never gone to an Apple store, like a physical Apple retail store, and ever had a Apple rep that was rude or mean or anything. It's almost like they're drinking some sort of happy Kool-Aid because they're so freaking nice. That said, I've never gotten anybody to just give me a new iPhone after I shattered it because that's just not the way it goes. I mean, have I you have ever experienced that experience it's like, is, are they, do they have the jurisdiction to do things like that? I think they kind of do, actually. I've heard a lot of stories about people either breaking their iPhones or dropping it in water, although I know they can kind of test for that kind of stuff now to see if it was the fault of the user or some other kind of fault. Um, but I, the, the closest thing I've ever gotten was I put a 
a solid state drive in my MacBook Pro and that crashed and I was getting kernel panics over and over and over again. And they they took it in, they they sent it to the shop, they tried to fix it. I had to then replace the original hard drive into the machine so they could actually do all the troubleshooting they needed to. And they were super nice about it and they were very helpful. And I had Apple Care, so I didn't have to pay much for it, I think, um, if anything. Um, but I, I've never actually brought in a broken device and had it completely replaced. That wasn't broken from the, um, that w that was, you know, that I broke, that I dropped, as opposed right. to getting a dud that then they replaced. So they'll replace duds for sure. I've just never had the experience of having something I've broken on my own accord be replaced for free. Our caller did n note that uh, the Apple folks uh, had record that he had been a loyal customer in the past. So there may be something where they can make a judgment call. Um, hey, this guy just bought a MacBook Pro and dropped, you know, $3,500 on a Mac Pro and, and you know, he's come in here every six months for the last couple of years, we can give him a replacement. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just guessing. I'm guessing <laughs> that there's probably something that maybe you go in the back and ask the manager, hey, do you think we could do this? Maybe there's a bit of that going on. Um, I, I know that that's not the norm. So nobody think that you can drop your iPad and just sort of wink and expect to, to get a, a new one. But I guess in some cases anyway, this kind of stuff does happen. By the way, this is almost bizarre, the original caller, so this was the, the poor gal who, who was so distraught about her broken iPad, knowing that, that it wasn't covered under Apple Care, called us back again. Um, and I, I won't play the, the voicemail, but I'll just summarize. She said she bit the bullet and she went back down to the Apple store. She was gonna replace the shattered iPad, she was gonna pay. And they told her that the system had a note in the system not to charge her. And she, went, and she went home and like checked her bank accounts because she, I mean, she walked out of there with a new iPad and she was like, I mean, I just, I'm confused. I don't know if I'm not understanding, but no, they threw her a bone as well. So two well, examples. Maybe they do do that. I know it's very, it's strange. Now she didn't, she didn't give me any indication if she's been a loyal Apple customer or how that may or may not have factored into it. But it's funny after her whole dilemma, she ended up getting a new one for free and I don't know what that means if the, if the, maybe the guy working at the Apple store or the gal working at the Apple store thought that she was really cute and said that the system had a note not to charge her, or maybe it really did. We'll never know. But in any case, it's actually two um, situations that turned out really well. So thanks for the voicemails. Um, if you want to call us, it's 757-504-IPAD. Of course, if you email us, it's iPadToday at twit.tv. Or you can send us a video. Now, usually... I'm always saying try to keep it to 30 seconds or less because we can't play longer videos on the show because we just don't have enough time. But I have to make an exception for Kevin S. Meyer. I think that's how you say your last name because he made this really cool video and he's like a natural on camera and I just kind of love him. So let's go ahead and play Kevin's video about how much he loves his stylus. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Leo. Um... I know you were going to talk about stylus for the iPad a while back, and I wanted to share one that I've had for about six months now that's really good. This is the Targus uh, stylus for iPad, and it costs about 10 bucks on Amazon. Works really good. I use it in an app. I use it in a lot of apps, but I use an app called Note Shelf, which is one that uh, you didn't profile on the note-taking one, but there's a lot of note-taking apps. This one's nice because it has like a wrist protection and stuff like that. You can go into the app, but um, this uh, is nice and smooth, works well when you go to a race. Doesn't leave smudge marks and tap stuff all over the uh, iPad like a stick of cheese or something would. <laughs> um, just works out really well. The other thing is Target stands behind this product. I saw two negative reviews on Amazon and people said, oh, you know, the tip was messed up or whatever, and Targus went in and offered to replace it for them. There's a large percentage of very positive reviews. People like this better than the pogo stick uh, pen that Andy and I could talked about a while back. Um, also, a little hack that I have for it. I took um, a lanyard, one of those old USB lanyards. Remember you'd get a USB stick back in the day and it'd have a lanyard yes, with I it? Yes, I have um, I took... <laughs> A uh, loop from that and put it on the end of the pen and then I took a old name tag thing fastened the other end to that and now I have the stylus 
on the lanyard so that I don't lose it because you don't want to pay 10 bucks for one of these and lose it. And uh, that is my hack and my stylus that I wanted to share with you. Thanks. I love the show. Bye. Thanks, Kevin. You rock. Honestly, it's like, it's kind of, Veronica, you know all about this because you and I both used to be behind the camera people who then went in front of the camera. And I, I just, I know that Kevin just seemed so like natural, like he's got his home office and he's just sort of telling me about something. And it's like, oh, I only wish that people watch our shows and are like, oh, this is so comfortable and interesting. It's, you know, it's hard to get out there and, and, and make a video explaining why you like the tech that you do and then send it in. So I really appreciate that. I want that now. I know. It's, it makes a lot of sense, especially since, um, <laughs> this is so silly, but um, if you look at my nails right now, they're really disgusting because I need a manicure, but I'm doing this new thing where I'm trying to grow out my nails and not bite them anymore. Oh, good for you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of myself. However, it has hindered my iPad experience a little bit because yeah. I have less fingertip area because, as we all know, fingernails don't work the same way fingertips do because they just don't. They don't. So I'm now like, eh, eh, I have to sort of touch it differently. So it's sort of weird. So a stylus is actually really, I think, going to come in handy for me. I, I think I need one. And I love the lanyard idea because these are just the sort of things that you lose. So Kevin's totally right about that. And thanks so much for sending the video in, Kevin. You rock. If you guys want to send in videos of your own, please do. Uh, we love we love to feature you. And, and more importantly, we just like to see the people that are watching the show. And, and you know, we really appreciate uh, your support. So it's always nice to know what people are doing with their iPads and their accessories at home. Anytime uh, you want to send a video, just don't send us actually any file. Just try to upload it to YouTube. That's what Kevin did or Vimeo or, you know, any place that you can have a video hosted and then just a URL to point us to it. And then we'll watch it and play it. And like I said, just if you, the shorter you can make it, the easier it is for us to feature it on the show. Veronica, I'm very excited for our app cap segment. Do you have an app uh, or do you have a, an app cap rather ready? Are you a hat wearer? I don't have a cap. Um, oh, well, yes. Hold while, on. while you're going to get your cap, I want to tell everybody. I can't hear you, so I'll be right back. Okay. I want to tell everybody about Fresh Books, which, if you haven't ever heard of Fresh Books, is the way to become. Uh, an invoicer extraordinaire. Now, I know you think, Sarah, there's no such thing. Just stop it. But it's true because FreshBooks is, if you, for some reason, have to invoice somebody, you know, let's say you, uh, you do some copy editing work or you mow somebody's lawn or for whatever reason, someone says, hey, you know, I'll give you 15 bucks if you do this or, or a thousand bucks if you complete this project. For whatever reason, there are a lot of reasons that you're not, you know, getting a weekly salary type of a thing. And you need to make sure that people pay you for the stuff that they agreed to pay you for. That's what an invoice is. That's what invoicing people is all about. Well, invoicing can be very complicated, especially if you're the kind of person who does a lot of little projects. Um, it can get out of control, and if you're emailing folks and they need your social security number and this and that, it's like you don't just want to be uh, or, uh, unorganized about it. FreshBooks is your solution. I'm telling you, this is the place uh, that will make your life easier. So all you have to do is go to FreshBooks.com, you set up an account, and uh, right off the bat, if you have three clients or less, so you're just working with three different companies or people, it's always free. FreshBooks is a free service for you. If you're working with more people than that, FreshBooks can handle as many folks as you want to add. The, um, the prices are very reasonable. What you can do is you can set up automatic payments. You can set up payment reminders. You know, So if you've got a company or a person who's like holding out on you, you don't have to be that person who's like, can you please pay me? I have to pay my rent. This is really embarrassing. FreshBooks will just kind of take care of all that correspondence for you. They will help you bill by the hour. If you're, if you're one of the people who needs to uh, keep track of how many actual hours you worked in a day, you know, legal stuff or, you know, anybody else. Um, they will set up a payment options, whether it's like via mail. I mean, like the postal service where you actually use stamps or PayPal or uh, directly to your bank account. You can get paid a variety of different ways. I mean, I challenge you to find a way that you want to get paid that FreshBooks doesn't cover. Um, and they also have um, they also have apps. So if you're on the go a lot and you just need to be accessing this information and updating it, 
you know, download the FreshBooks app for your iPhone and and uh, make sure that you're you're getting paid when you want to get paid and you're not missing anything because you're unorganized. Some people just can't do that sort of thing without a little bit of help. So FreshBooks is the place to go. Again, your first three clients are completely free. Try it out now at FreshBooks.com. We love them and we thank them for sponsoring this episode of iPad Today. Veronica, I love your hat. That's a good thank one. Thank you. It's very it's my Devo hat. It's very is is that what it is? It's a Devo hat. Yeah, it's a Devo hat. You know, whip it. Oh yeah, no, I I know, I know, I know who Devo is. Uh, you know. also have a cat named Devo, so I assume that you and Ryan are just like really big Devo fans. It's a theme in the house. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I can dig it. I, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'll be Ranger Bob. This is one of my favorites. Oh yeah, I want to see your hat. Um, this is uh, this is oh, my Ranger good. Bob hat. It's good stuff. Whenever I wear this, Leo corrects me and tells me it's a, I don't know, he's got some fancy word for what kind of hat this is, but I feel like I'm a park ranger. That's what I am. So, um, Veronica, the reason that we're wearing these ridiculous hats is because this is the part of the show, at the end of the show, where we choose our app cap awards. And these are our app caps. And there's really no really more um, in detail reason, just a good way to wear hats. And Leo <laughs> likes wearing hats, so we say- I don't need an excuse to wear a good hat. Exactly, let's just, let's just make a segment that requires us to wear hats. So uh, we'll start off with my overall app cap winner of the week. This is actually not a new app. Um, it's something called Photopedia Heritage. But the reason that I am covering it today is because every once in a while, um, even though I look at apps for a living and it's a wonderful life, I, I get to, there's certain weeks where I, you know, I kind of look at the app store and I feel a little uninspired and there's just nothing that's new that I like. Or maybe I tried a few apps and they're crashy and I don't want to recommend them to you guys. Or they get a lot of bad reviews because that happens with apps sometimes where it seems like a great concept, but people just aren't loving it. So I don't even want to bother. Um, but this is actually in iTunes um, top 50 apps. Kind of like if you only had 50 apps, this should be in your collection. And it had completely escaped me before. I think um, it was released back in February. So let's just go ahead and launch it. Um, again, this is uh, Photopedia. It's called Heritage, but it's, uh, it's by a company called Photopedia who also has um, a, a really nice website. And this is all like uh, UNESCO heritage sites. So if I want to go ahead and just start, um, it's better to show you than to, to tell you about it. What I'm doing is I'm exploring Africa. I've decided to look at some beautiful pictures of Africa. Um, I'm always wanting to go to Africa and I'm always trying to find a reason to get sent there for work or something. But these are a variety of, these aren't just like landscapes in Africa. These are specific places that are designated historic um, by, by UNESCO, right? So for example, this is uh, the Cape Coast Castle. So I, I look down in my navigation, I'm, I'm in Africa, I'm in West Africa, I'm in Ghana, and I'm in the Forts and Castles area, and this is the Cape Coast Ca Castle. It's beautiful. If I want to know, for example, a little bit, you know, maybe it's escaping me where Ghana is in West Africa, because of course Africa is really big, I can look at it on a map. Um, and get a better, you know, idea of what exactly I'm looking at. You know, you can zoom out and zoom in. I'm looking at the satellite view, but you can look at a map view as well or hybrid. Our Wi-Fi is a little bit slow in here, but you get the idea. Um, and the the idea is is that I mean, there's so many places that you can visit in the world, but there are certain places that are extra special. Um, and that's why they are World Heritage sites. I mean, they're like some of the most beautiful places in the world. So if I go back to the top here, um, this gives me more of like, I'm looking at more of a worldview. I'm, I'm out of Africa now um, and I can start in Asia or I can choose a different continent. And if I just start clicking through, so this is uh, Palmyra, uh, which is in Syria, which of course is in the Middle East. I'm not going to Syria anytime soon um, for somewhat obvious reasons. Uh, maybe if you're more adventurous, you would, but I'm not going to. But I'm not really super familiar with the site or, or you know, with the historical significance. So that gives me a really good reason to start doing some research because this is beautiful. And I mean, it's it's a, it's a really special place for for um, for uh, specific reasons. Again, Italy, Venice, Venice, uh, a lot of people are familiar with. But it's like, well, what is what is special about Venice? Um, if you click the little information tab. Um, it'll uh, link over to Photopedia, which well, it's supposed to give you extra information here. I'm not exactly sure why it's not doing that now, but uh, you get you know you get a sense of what uh, what where these beautiful places that are extra special are in the world. I mean, think Taj Mahal. That's a very obvious one, 
but there are a lot of these. I mean, again, Middle East is a good example because I there are a lot of places in the Middle East that I just haven't been. I mean, what about somewhere in Saudi Arabia? I, you know, I, I, what, what is interesting about this? What is significant about this? And the pictures are gorgeous, and of course, it's optimized for the iPad as well, and it's free. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I would necessarily um, suggest that you download this if it was five dollars, because unless you were like a super big world traveler, lonely planeter. A lot of these places you might be like, I don't know, I just, I don't really, I don't know. I don't want to pay for these pictures because <laughs> I can get them online, but this is free. So it's kind of just like the iPad um, example of what Photopedia, and that's F-O-T-O-pedia, not P-H-O-T-O for any of our audio listeners. Um, Photopedia.com, um, and the app is called Photopedia Heritage, and I had a lot of fun with it. I mean, it's kind of like this... It's almost like uh, looking through Jet Setter. It's a little bit of an escape to look at some beautiful places that I haven't been and maybe I would like to go um, in the future. And of course, you've got all your social networky links too where you can you know, tweet the picture out or save as wallpaper or email it to Veronica. And then you can also favorite places if, I mean, if you're really starting to take this stuff seriously, I can go ahead and, and, and favorite this photo to, to come back to later. That's awesome. It's great for travel suggestions. Yeah, I think so too. All right, Veronica, you're up. What is your app cap? All right, well, mine probably won't go as long as yours, but I am a huge <laughs> fan of Goodreader. It's one of my favorite applications, not just for viewing documents, PDFs, making edits to things, um, but it's also great for, for, like, I sign documents on this thing, and that's why that video that you just had earlier uh, made me really want to get one of those styluses because when I try to sign a document on Goodreader, this is no fault of the application. It's all me. I look like a preschooler. Like I, I'm writing my name as though I have just learned to write for the very first time. And so I think a stylus would really help with that. I can't even take myself seriously with this hat right now. No, it's okay. cool. No. I mean, nobody can. It's just, it's, it's Thursday. But I do things like I keep um, a lot of digital comics in here and then I can open them into uh, whatever comics app I'm using. I use it for documents when I'm going on trips and I'm not sure if I'm going to have a Wi-Fi or a data connection with my iPad, mm -hmm. like if I'm going overseas. Um, so it's really great for that. It's You can uh, connect to your different web services like Dropbox or MobileMe or Box.net and you can sync entire folders or you can sync specific files and then you can move things into folders. So it's it's basically like having file management on your iPad in a really nice, clean way. And I've been using it for probably three months now and I don't know how I could live without it at this point. And there's an iPhone version as well, but the iPad version is really nice for making changes to and editing documents. Cool. Goodreader is, it's $4.99, so it's the sort of thing where if you're like Veronica and this is a tool that is indispensable to you, $5 goes a really long way. Um, mm -hmm. People love file management. I mean, we're constantly getting folks saying, why don't you revisit the file management uh, theme? I think Goodreader, and I mean, it's certainly not the only file management tool out there, but across the board, um, there are always those apps where if you don't have it, you know, you, you'll, you'll go on with your life and you're sort of just blissfully unaware. But once you do, you think, oh, my mm -hmm. gosh, I could never not have this and enjoy the iPad experience anymore. It sounds like that's what Goodreader is for you. Yeah, it's really, it's funny, too, because it seems like it's primarily an application for making notations to PDF documents and for editing them and adding notes and highlighting and, and doing things like that. But I, I almost use it more for the file management than anything else at this point. So it's kind of like a nice added bonus. Cool. Well, that's good reader. That's Veronica's app cap, everybody. Veronica, who put on a Devo hat for the show and everything. I mean, I'm gotta, glad I had gotta something give in the room, you, man. Gotta give it to you for playing along. No shame. Yeah. No shame. Every time when we when we've had guest hosts in the past, they go, "Hats, okay. What's going on over there?" And I'm like, "It's Leo. It's just you know, we've got a whole like, collection on, of hats in the studio. It's just we're hat people. I I don't know what else to say. Anyway, we've come to the end of our show, Veronica. Thank you so much for being my co-host today. It was so much fun. I hope that you'll come back and and join me again soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, remember to subscribe a million different ways. Twit.tv slash IPT is where you can find our show, our show notes, our archive shows, and everything else. Uh, never miss a show again because we make it really easy for you to watch. We're on YouTube as well. Um, until next week, I'm Sarah Lane signing off on iPad Today. Ow! Ow. We also howl at the end of the show. Ow! Good. Sound more like a coyote. No, that was very good. That was a good howl. <laughs>